Um, many victims reported the same distinctive physical characteristic about their attacker to the police, and that was that he had a micro penis. Because of course he did. Greetings friends, welcome to my channel and welcome to this video. My name is Brittany, if you've never been here before, hello, hi, welcome to what we have going on here. Before we get started, I would love it if you would join the Brat Pack by subscribing and hitting the bell. I put out new videos every week, both true crime and beauty related, and I would love to hang out with you. So go ahead and do that. It takes like a second, it's free, it's really good, so uh, I'll give you a second. Thank you in advance. You're so sweet. Thank you. So real quick, I'm going to need you guys to let me know how the audio sounds. I'm doing something new in that I'm leaving my air conditioner on because it is like 100 degrees in Los Angeles today when I'm filming. And I know it was my dumb decision to wear a long sleeve. I know. But that aside, it's just really warm. So I'm going to try filming with the air on and I'm not going to know until I'm editing if it sounds bad. So I need you to let me know down below because even if it sounds bad to me because I'm a perfectionist, it might not sound bad to you. If you have Virgo in your chart, you'll understand that. I need you to let me know if I'm overthinking the audio here, okay? Okay. So anyways, guys, today's case is a good one. We're going to be doing a serial killer case. And if you're watching, I'm sure, like me, you're strangely um, interested in serial killers. Or maybe it's not so strange. I feel like it's gotten a little more common for people to express their interest in this. I don't know anybody personally in my day-to-day -day life that is as into this as I am, but um, I know it is more common than it used to be. Anyways, this case that we're going to be talking today was actually suggested to me several times by my new YouTube friend Kim, so hi Kim, this one is for you. If any of you, this isn't like a collab or anything, but I'll put Kim's uh, YouTube down below if you're into makeup and reviews specifically. I know I used to do a lot of reviews and I don't really do reviews anymore. Kim's got the reviews and she uploads like crazy so I'll link her down below in case you are missing that from my channel since I don't really do it anymore so down below for Kim but anyways she suggested this case over and over and it's gonna be the case of the Golden State Killer now I'm sure you've probably heard of this case especially if you're from California the Golden State but if you haven't it might be because you know him by one of his many other names he was known by several names throughout his crime career the Visalia Ransacker the East Area Rapist, the original Night Stalker, or the Diamond Knot Killer. Have you heard of any of them? Those are all the same guy, Golden State Killer. Glad we're up, up to speed. Glad we're up to speed. And this guy's crime career started in the 1970s, and he wasn't caught until 2018. This just happened. He just got caught, and he was able to evade the police for 40 years because he was, wait for it, a police officer. Yeah, dude, this is a totally crazy case. Lots of frustrating twists and turns, and he ended up getting caught in a pretty inventive and to some controversial way. So it's gonna be a, like a nice, not fun, fun's not the word, just a very interesting little time we're gonna have together here. So I think it's time that we just get into this case, and of course, serial killer, assaults, things like that. Viewer discretion is advised, as always. Let's go. Okay, so the Golden State Killer, did I just go cross-eyed? Probably. Okay, so the Golden State Killer, or Joseph James D'Angelo, as we now know him, was born in New York um, on November 8th, 1945, which makes him a Scorpio, and he's one of the few Scorpio serial killers, actually. I know people think Scorpios are, like, the evil one, but there are not that many Scorpio serial killers out there. Anyways, Joseph was born to Kathleen, his mother, who was a waitress at Denny's, and his father, James, who was a U.S. Army sergeant. He was the eldest of four children, having two younger sisters and a younger brother. And there's not a ton that's known about his childhood that I was able to find online. But from what I was able to put together, uh, it seemed like he was sort of an army brat moving around to wherever his dad was stationed at the time. And there was only one notable trauma that we know of right now, which I'm sure things will develop, this just came out, um, but one notable trauma from his childhood. While his father was deployed in Germany, D'Angelo, which is what I'm, I'm just going to call him D'Angelo, um, he witnessed his seven-year-old younger sister being sexually assaulted by, I believe it was two um, men in the military. Experts on the case speculate that this trauma of seeing his young sister, which of course would be traumatic. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that seeing that wouldn't be traumatic, um, but they speculate that seeing this trauma, seeing this assault on his young sister could have done something in his brain to then explain his later crimes. But I would just like to say very clearly that this is to explain 
not excused because there is no excuse for what he did because a lot of people go through trauma and don't end up killing people, right? Okay. Okay, and as I previously stated, there's not a ton of information on D'Angelo's um, childhood life that I was able to find. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit to the information that we do know now. At some point when D'Angelo was young, his family moved from New York to California. And in 1964, D'Angelo joined the US Navy and he served two years in Vietnam actually. Okay, I've been blending that powder into my face for long enough. After the Navy, he enrolled in college and he was known to be a pretty smart guy. He graduated with honors and got an associate's degree in, guess what? Guess what? Police science, which I guess isn't that much of a stretch since I already told you that he ends up being a cop. <sighs> My storytelling skills aren't that great, I'm sorry. So while in college in 1970, he met a woman named Bonnie, whose last name I'm gonna leave out because I'm sure she doesn't enjoy being connected with this case. If you're really curious, I'm sure you can find it on Google because I was able to, but I'm gonna leave her name out. But he met Bonnie and the two of them um, got engaged. But for some reason, um, luckily for her and unknown to us, as to why she actually broke the engagement off. And this is thought to have been sort of a triggering thing for him as well, because later in one of his crimes, um, and one of his assaults upon a woman um, that we're gonna get into because he, he had many different things that he did to people um, while he was raping a woman, he kept referring to her as Bonnie and saying like, I hate you, Bonnie, I hate you, Bonnie. Um, so, and this was years later, so. Obviously this breakup did something to uh, last within him. The rage, that sentence was real good, okay. So after getting his associate's degree in police science, he moved on to getting his bachelor's degree in criminology in 1971. And after taking a few more classes after um, completing that bachelor's degree, he went through the 32 week program to become a police officer. This actually put on highlight really nice. I'm surprised, interesting. Just like an eyeshadow brush, but. So from 1973 to 1976, uh, D'Angelo worked in the burglary division of a police department, the Exeter Police Department, which was, I believe, in Northern California, um, close to the Visalia area. And while employed at this police department in 1974, he began his first known set of crimes where he became known as the Visalia Ransacker. And that's just the first of the several names that he would go by throughout his career. I'm sure you can tell by his name, the Visalia Ransacker, that he would break into people's homes and ransack their homes. We'll get into that a little more down the line. I'm trying to stay on the timeline so it doesn't get too confusing for you. So also during his time um, employed at the Exeter Police Department in 1973, um, D'Angelo actually got married to a woman named Sharon Marie Huddle, and the two had three daughters together. The two were together um, for several years, but they separated in 1991, and even though Huddle was a divorce attorney by trade, like that was her job at the time that they separated, um, they never got legally divorced, which I think is a little bit strange. She did finally divorce him in 2018 once he was arrested, um, but she stayed together with him all of that time. People have a lot of theories as to why she stayed with him, obviously, um, considering they were essentially estranged from 1991 until, you know, well, I guess they're still estranged, but until she got her divorce. And people wonder why that would be, why, they, why she would choose to stay married to him when her job was to divorce people. She would know how to do it, you know? Some wonder if maybe she knew something about what he was doing um, and stayed married to him so that she wouldn't have to testify against him because she was his wife, or if maybe he threatened her to not divorce him, or he would maybe kill her because he was a very dangerous man. It is unsure. The only people who would know would be him and her, and neither of them are talking. I believe she's released like one statement um, since his arrest, and it essentially said that she felt terrible for the families of the victims, but that she wanted privacy for her and her daughters and her family. So that's what we have, and do with that information what you will. <laughs> So from 1974 to the end of 1975, now married D'Angelo starts committing the crimes that would dub him as the Visalia Ransacker. Okay guys, I know I previously stated that Visalia was in Northern California, but I just looked um, on a map and it's more, okay. So it's north of me, but it's like the halfway point between Sacramento, which is where he'd commit some of his crimes later, and Los Angeles, where he would commit later crimes even later. 
later crimes even later. But with that said, I'm not exactly known for my map reading skills, so maybe if you want to look into that yourself, you're welcome to, but to me, that's what it looks like. So anyways, as the Visalia ransacker, he committed over 120 burglaries, but they weren't normal burglaries. Like he would go into your home and he would take the women's underwear and just scatter them all across the room. He was known to take items, but he wouldn't take like high dollar value items. He would see expensive things. There'd be like money or jewels or whatever. And he would take like costume jewelry or just like one earring, something that was just sort of a momentum, a token if you will, a trophy, if you will, um, from the property. And he never got caught doing this because remember, what is he doing for a living? That's right. He's working for the burglary unit of a police department. So while he's committing all of these burglaries, he's also being trained and learning how to not be caught. Now, during this time in by the Visalia area, he actually commits his first murder. In 1975, to Professor Claude Snailing woke up to a noise. Um, and in going to expect in, uh, uh, and in going to inspect that noise, he finds his 16-year-old daughter being led away from their house by a man in a ski mask with a knife. So naturally he tried to intervene and be like, that's my daughter, you know, don't take my daughter, right? And um, D'Angelo shot him. He then kicked the 16 year old girl several times and fled the scene. Um, and unfortunately, Mr. Snailing did not survive this gunshot. I did read somewhere that they were able to link this to the Visalia ransacker because the gun that we used that was used to kill Professor Snailing was stolen from a previous house that the ransacker had burgled. This murder was thought to be a necessity murder um, more than anything. It doesn't seem like it was something that he planned to do because he didn't start his actual killing spree until 1978. And remember, right now we're in 1975. But he was clearly escalating in general because before this instant, he had never tried to take a girl. As far as we know, he would just ransack homes when people weren't home. So he was clearly escalating by trying to take this girl in the first place. This was not his pattern yet forever. He never really abducted anybody, but there was one more attempted murder um, in 1975, same year. And this was in December. Police had been doing a stakeout on the area because of, you know, all of the burglaries in the area and Professor Snailing's murder. So there were some cops doing a little stakeout um, when one officer, Officer McGowan, he was present during one of these stakeouts and he w witnessed, I believe he saw a man in a ski mask in the area. And he's like, whoa, I should probably chase this guy. So he pursues him and he ends up getting him cornered uh, like by a fence, I believe it was. And um, D'Angelo was like, don't shoot, don't shoot. And in the split second that the officer sort of hesitated, D'Angelo shot at him. And I guess he had his hand up with like the flashlight. You know how cops are like this. The bullet hit the flashlight and like shattered that glass into his face. So he only suffered minor injuries instead of, you know, a fatal gunshot wound to the head. But in the time, you know, that he shot him, D'Angelo was able to flee the scene. So D'Angelo was really good at moving around to different areas um, to, to avoid detection because he knew that different police departments didn't really share information with each other because he worked in police departments. So naturally, the following year in 1976, D'Angelo moved up north um, to the Sacramento area and got a job at the Auburn Police Department. And it's while in Northern California between 1976 and 1979 that D'Angelo again started to escalate um, his, his crimes. And he began his spree of rapes on women and teenage girls and became dubbed the East Area Rapist. While active as the East Area Rapist, he is thought to have committed at least 50 rapes, but they believe it was more. So what D'Angelo would do is he would first choose a woman and he would begin to stalk her. Many of the, the victims after the fact when they were questioned by police stated that they did notice prior to the attack that it seemed like somebody might have been in their home but they hadn't really taken anything or done anything, just little things would be moved around. So they weren't sure if like, they did it or if somebody was actually in their home so that it wasn't reported. But a lot of them reported after the fact that they did notice these things. So initially, D'Angelo would target what he would consider to be easy targets, single women or women with just children. 
that had a home that was only one story so that he could easily get in and easily get out and easily be able to like stalk her from the street and look in her windows. But eventually he decided he wanted more of a challenge than that and he started to attack couples. The victims would say that they would awaken in the night to a man standing over their bed um, oftentimes with a flashlight shine directly in their eyes to disorient them and make it difficult for them to react or see him. He would take the men and after the men were tied up, he would like lay them on their stomachs and set a, a stack of kitchen plates on their back, telling them that if they moved or tried to escape, he would hear, he would hear the plates fall and he would immediately kill um, the women. He would then take the women into another room usually, but make sure they were within earshot and he would assault the woman and make the man listen to his wife being raped. He was also known to stay in their homes after the attack. He wouldn't leave right away, which I think was just a way to kind of terrorize them further. He would, you know, rape the woman and then go and rummage through their house, make a snack, like hang out and lounge in their house and then go back and rape her again and stay and hang. Yeah. He was just an awful dude. Honestly, one victim reported that the night that she was attacked, Ooh. That the night that she was attacked, her husband had just left for work, so it must have been the early morning hours, or maybe he worked graveyard, I'm not 100% sure on that, um, but her young son had come and gotten into bed with her so that he could, like, you know, snuggle with his mommy, and shortly after her husband left, like, real quick, um, she heard footsteps in her hallway, um, and before she could react, there was, you know, D'Angelo in her room, and he proceeded to bind the woman and her son, and then assault her in front of her young child. What kind of trauma is that gonna I don't I don't even know it's a dick move bro that's that's what it is it's not whatever in another case to just show I mean obviously all the stuff he did was awful like we can agree raping people from ransacking their homes later murdering people it's all awful um, but just to illustrate like that he had no boundaries um, in 1977 he assaulted his youngest victim her name was Margaret Wardlow and she was only 13 years old I actually watched an er interview with her and she said that she was actually obsessed with the case um, at the time that it happened. She had been watching the news and seeing it going on, which 13 year olds doing that. I get that. Right guys? We all, uh, we all get that. That's why we're here. Um, anyways, but so she knew about the case and when she woke up to a man over her bed at like two o'clock in the morning, she at first thought it was her neighbor messing with her, which is odd. I don't know what kind of neighbor she had, um, but she quickly realized that it wasn't and um, D'Angelo bound both her and her mother, put the plates on her mother's back, and then proceeded to assault her. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out how to work this part into the video. I'm not really sure how um, to put this in fluidly, but um, many victims reported the same distinctive physical characteristic about their attacker to the police, and that was that he had a micro penis. Of course he did. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to Giangelo D'Angelo's second and third murder after Professor Snailing, okay? So again, this is sort of a crossover timeline. Um, at this time, he had not murdered anyone since Professor Snailing, and this seemed, this too seemed to be sort of a necessity killing rather than like a planned murder. So this happened in February, ooh, of 1978. Brian and Katie Madgery um, were out at night. It was around, I believe, 9 p.m. and they were walking their dog. They were just out walking their dog when they um, ran into D'Angelo in the street. I can't really, I couldn't figure out what prompted the attack because he wasn't known to attack couples in public places. He would break into homes in the middle of the night. So I'm not sure what happened. If he was just like a rabid dog on the loose that night or what but he started to attack them and he pursued them into a yard and Brian, who was like a young fit man, started to fight back and D'Angelo shot him. And then he proceeded to shoot Katie as well, um, you know, cause she was there and, you know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm not gonna pretend I know what's going on in these killers heads, but he um, killed both of them on the street randomly. And these were initially thought to be his first victims before he was eventually connected with Professor Snailing later on. So we're gonna fast forward a little bit to August of 1979. D'Angelo was caught shoplifting at a local store for, get this, he was shopping for dog repellent and a hammer. 
and instead of police you know investigating this because those are kind of weird things to be caught with they um fired him obviously because he shoplifted and he's a police officer and he was just like yep you're right i did it i'm sorry like he didn't want them looking into him and he ended up getting six months probation for this but they didn't look into it any further they just fired him and let him be on his merry way that shortly after um this firing the police chief that fired him was woken in the night by his young daughter stating that there was a man outside her window with a flashlight and a ski mask and it was i don't know if it's ever been proven but the police chief does believe this was d'angelo wanting you know payback for the firing so as is normal for d'angelo after getting caught and being you know in a worried state he quickly moved out of the area in october of 1979 and he moved to the los angeles area of southern california that's where i live and this is where he started consistently committing murders and he was dubbed as the original night stalker which i find to be odd that they would it's so mouthy the original night stalker when richard ramirez would come later and be dubbed the night stalker so i find that a little bit odd i'm not really sure why they did that but that's what they did but anyways the murders so shortly after moving to southern california in december of 1979 d'angelo would murder his next couple and these were his first murders in southern california so the couple's name was robert offerman and deborah manning and d'angelo broke into their home in the middle of the night entering through a sliding glass door as the couple slept and he tied robert up placed a stack of plates on his back and then proceeded to rape deborah before murdering them both so in 1980 d'angelo purchased his uh, home that he would own or ever uh, in Citrus Heights, California, which is near Sacramento. He owned the home for 40 years and that is where he would eventually be arrested later in life. Um, and it's unclear, he bought the house in Northern California, but it's unclear if he lived there, or if he maybe rented it out because his crime still continued in the Los Angeles area. And that drive, what is it? Nine hours from LA to Sacramento, I believe. So I don't know if he was doing that drive or if he, lived in the LA area but owned a home up north but either way he bought his home in Citrus Heights California and continued murdering people in Southern California until 1986 so six years hopefully I I'm telling the story well I feel a little sloppy I'm sorry if it's a little sloppy so in March of 1980 D'Angelo murdered his next couple Charlene and Lyman Smith and they lived in Ventura County which is just like a neighboring city of Los Angeles like a neighboring county of Los Angeles. So this murder was particularly brutal and this was one of the one of the murders that he did that at least to me seemed to show police that he had knowledge of police investigative tactics and that he was consciously trying to make this crime scene look like a botched robbery so it wouldn't be connected to his other crimes. This poor couple was beaten to death by a log in their fireplace after being tied up and um, Charlene being raped. It said that him using the log instead of, I don't know, a gun or a knife or something he brought with him was meant to make it look like a spontaneous act, like he had come to rob and just happened um, to rape and murder this couple with something that was just there instead of bringing something with him, which would make it seem more likely that it was planned, because if you're planning to murder somebody, you're gonna bring a weapon with you that you will then use. By taking something from inside the house, it makes it look more like, oh, I guess I'll just do this since I'm here, you know what I mean? So in August of 1980, Keith and Patrice Harrington, newlyweds who had only been married a couple of months, were murdered in Orange County, which again is in Southern California, if you're not familiar. As horrible as this murder was, it actually did have a positive outcome in that it pushed ahead California Prop 69 um, due to Keith, the murder victim's older brother, putting a lot of money into this campaign um, to make it happen. I think he did like a couple of million dollars. If I, if I read correctly and I remember correctly, I didn't write it down. Now what this essentially means is that anyone um, who is convicted of a felony or there's a couple of other crimes, but um, any felons have to give a DNA sample to have on file to be able to use in future crimes. Which is ironic considering how D'Angelo was later caught, but we will get into that later. We're getting there. We're working our way towards it. The following year, in February of 1981, Manula Within, or Wythin, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, um, but she, unfortunately and tragically, was murdered in her home. Though the, l the previous murders had all been 
of couples, Manula was murdered alone, and it is theorized that D'Angelo didn't actually know that she was alone because her husband had been unexpected unexpectedly admitted into the hospital so he probably assumed that they would both be there and when he got there it was just her so he just killed her um but the way that her body was found is that her husband was like my wife isn't visiting me i cannot get a hold of her so he called the police um and when they investigated they found her body again this one was made to look like a botched robbery and he actually went a step further um he besides using a weapon from inside the home which he did do he actually took a tv from inside the house and like left it on their lawn to make it look like he was trying to like steal a tv and then maybe it was too heavy and he left it to again try to throw police off his case but they they knew so in july of 1981 d'angelo murdered his last couple it wouldn't be his last murder but it would be his last murder of a couple Cherry Domingo and Gregory Sanchez were murdered inside their homes, but it appears from the evidence that this murder did not go as planned for D'Angelo as his normal murders um, went. It appears that Gregory might have heard something and woke up because he was actually shot in the hallway and not in the bedroom. So it looks like maybe he woke up and he encountered D'Angelo in the hallway and D'Angelo panicked and just shot him instead of, you know, tying him up and making him listen to Cherry being Great. It's believed that this interaction with Gregory was sort of eye-opening for D'Angelo um, because Gregory was younger and a lot bigger than him and able to fight back. It's thought that maybe he realized like, oh, I'm getting, it's getting too dangerous for me to get in and get out and be successful at this. So he stopped targeting couples after murdering these two people. And it actually must have really shook him up because he took a break after this, murdering this couple for four years um, before he would murder his next victim, which would actually end up being his last victim. So during this break from his murders, D'Angelo did something else that was super creepy and it wasn't something he only did once. This is just one of the instances I'm going to discuss. So after he would assault these women, and this is just to give you an idea of how like awful of a monster this guy is. He would call his victims afterwards to terrorize them. In October of 1982, he got the phone number of one of his previous rape victims' place of employment, okay? This was a girl he raped in the 70s. It is now 1982. So he got her work phone number and he called her at work to harass her. This is a place she didn't even work at at the time that she was assaulted. So how did she, how did he know that she worked there? Was he still stalking them? Was he living in that area and happened to see her? We don't know, but how creepy would that be for you? I, it, it just, what a dick, right? Trying to keep her like under his thumb and keep her scared. It's so messed up. I listened to a couple of the recordings of these phone calls because he didn't just do it once. He did this more than once. And they're super creepy. You can Google them if you're like me and you just need to hear them, but I would recommend maybe not watching them at night or listening to them at night because they're honestly super creepy. But uh, I, I understand that, you know, some people like to look things up. I'm, I'm one of those people. So if you want to, they're out there. It's just, you know, I'm not gonna include it because that's not, I don't do that really. I haven't yet at least. So now May 4th, 1986, D'Angelo is going to commit his last murder. 18 year old Janelle Cruz was murdered in her home while her family was away, so she was home alone. She was unfortunately raped and then beaten to death with, I believe it was a pipe wrench while she was still in her bed. And at this point, D'Angelo was in his 40s and for whatever reason, he just stopped. And I find this so odd because most serial killers, at least that I've looked into, don't stop until they're either caught or they're killed, right? So it's just so odd to me. I don't know, I guess because he's in his 40s and he has a family at this point that maybe he just decided now's the time. I guess I'll just give up this blood thirst that I have, you know? But he was active in assaulting and murdering people for so many years that it doesn't really make sense to me that he just stop. I personally, this is my opinion, think maybe he didn't and that there are just cases that aren't linked to him because he was smart. He knew how to evade police. Maybe he just completely switched up the way he was killing people, you know? I don't know, but it just seems really weird to me. Let me know what you think, but from what I know, it's just, it's not normal for a serial killer to just be like, okay, I'm done. I've done what I needed to do here. 
So at this point, the case went cold and it wasn't solved for 30 years. Is that right? Yeah, he wasn't caught until 2018. So yeah, 30, 30 years. So while investigating, police noticed that there were several things that um, D'Angelo had done to purposely throw them off his trail. They believed at this point that he either had a military or police background because the things that he would do to throw them off his trail are things that at this time people didn't really know unless they had inside knowledge. I feel like now everyone <laughs> knows everything. There's so much information out there that it's a little bit different, but back then, what he was doing, you would have to kind of, you know, know police work to be able to know to do. He would choose to kill victims from items that he took from inside their home, as I stated before, to make it look like a botched robbery. Going as far as taking that TV out of Manila's home, you know, that was a big one of like obvious, this is what I'm doing. But fortunately for police, he wasn't as smart or as evasive as he thought he would, as he thought he was. He was doing these things to try to throw them off his trail, but he was being super dumb in other ways. For example, he would always wear the same shoes and he would leave footprints outside the house in a lot of the cases. And he also would bring very distinctive pre-tied shoelaces to bind his victims with and the knots that he was used were so distinct um, that he actually for a short period of time was coined the diamond knot killer because the knot sort of looked like a diamond and they were a very they were like an advanced knot and a specific knot not one that just a knot one that just anybody would use so though he was like oh i'm gonna kill you with this and i'm gonna try to take your tv i'm also going to use this very specific knot to tie you up which is then going to connect all my cases but even so, during this time, they didn't realize that the murders, the rapes, and the ransackings were all the same person. They were just able to, like, connect the murders to each other, you know? You know. Fortunately, though, by 2001, DNA had advanced to such a point that police were able to connect the cases from the East Area Rapist to the cases of the original Night Stalker. But they were not yet able to link that to the Visalia ransacking cases. Therefore, Professor Snailing's case was not connected with the other murders at this point. So in 2013, new public interest got shined on this cold case because of a writer. Her name was Michelle McNamara and she became super obsessed with trying to um, solve this case and get public attention for this case. Um, and she is actually the one who dubbed him as the Golden State Killer, I believe in like a newspaper article, connecting all of these various names to one name and one name only, what he's known as now and that is the golden state killer she ended up writing a book um on the case called i'll be gone in the dark and i haven't personally gotten a chance to read this yet i have it in my like audible list it's what i'm going to use my next month's credit on but i haven't gotten a chance to read that just yet um, but i'm excited to do so i guess it was on um the bestsellers list for 15 consecutive weeks so and it's so sad because unfortunately um, michelle mcnamara died suddenly in 2016 before this case had even resolved and before she was able to finish the book. Um, so her husband, oh my God, so sweet. His name is Patton Oswald. If you saw his photo, which I'm gonna put in editing, uh, he's a comedian, I'm sure you recognize his face. He commissioned a few people who were writers, I believe, to help finish the book after the fact. Um, and then, you know, it went on to be a bestseller. And in her doing that, it didn't bring new information to the case, but it brought new public interest. And with public interest comes more resources from the police, which is what kickstarted solving the case in the first place. And unfortunately she wasn't able to see what her work did, but it's still amazing. I mean, it's an, it's a great, it's a great legacy, right? It's, um, we all just want to do, I mean, I, I can't say we all, but I feel like a lot of people just want to do something meaningful with their lives and look at that. So now we're going to get into how Joseph James D'Angelo was caught by the police. So now we're zoning in on him getting caught, right? So it has now become, as I'm sure you all know, the new normal for people to submit their DNA to ancestry sites. The only one I can really think of is 23andMe. But you know, there's other ones out there. So there has now been a DNA database created online called GEDmatch. GEDmatch? GEDmatch. Um, so this is what law enforcement did and this is what people find to be a little bit shady. They made a fake profile on one of these ancestry websites where they then, instead of uploading their own DNA, uploaded DNA from one of the Golden State Killer cases, okay? And from doing this, they were able to find several familial matches um, to the killer's DNA. So through doing this, they were able to put together sort of like a family tree where they could then cross-reference those people by age, um, 
looking for only men of a certain age who had a proximity to California during the time of the crimes. And after doing all of this, they were able to zero in on Joseph James D'Angelo. So they needed to get D'Angelo's DNA in order to confirm this. They had him as a suspect, but they didn't actually have his DNA. So they could have gotten a court order and just, you know, went up to his door and been like, here you go, give me the DNA. But then he would know they were onto him. He could run, he could, you know what I mean? Like he would know. So what they did instead is they staked him out um, and waited for him to discard his DNA, which is not an uncommon thing. Um, so what they ended up doing is like swapping a door handle. I think it was a car. I think it was a car, um, but they didn't want to just use that. They also um, took a discarded tissue from his trash because, you know, once trash is out on the street, it is public. If you didn't know that, now you know. And when they tested this DNA, it was a match to the Golden State Killer. Now, a lot of people have an issue. I don't know if it's a lot. Sure, it's a lot. People have an issue with the way that he was found by them using the DNA through Jetmatch, which, I don't know, people think it's or rightfully say it's an invasion of privacy. I, at this point, don't personally have a problem with it. Um, I'm open to hearing from those who do down below. Um, I just don't know if you've committed murders, if you're entitled to that privacy. I don't know. Let me know what you think. I personally have never given my DNA to any of those sites. And that's a personal reason that's not related to like this. I have my own reasons for not doing that. But I'd like to know as someone who's strongly against it in murder cases, I would like to know like why. But then again, as helpful as it could be, I do wonder you know, how it could be used and how this technology could be corrupted later down the line. I'm a little skeptical on that, but I'm curious as to what you guys think about this because it is it is one of those ones that is controversial. Um, but at this point with the information I have, which I'm open to more information, um, I'm cool with them using it to catch this guy. That's how I feel right now. So in April of 2018, Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested at his Citrus Heights home, Citrus Heights home, and he was charged with eight counts of first degree murder. He was then charged later with the other four counts of murder in May of the same year, 2018. So if you guys have seen any of the videos of Joseph James D'Angelo on YouTube, because I have looked it up because I believe that they're going to be broadcasting the whole trial if I'm right. Well, either way, if you've seen any videos of him now, you might have had the same reaction I did, which is like, wow, he's so old, like such a feeble old man. Well, in doing some research, it seems that this is not the case. And this is likely a big old act to make us feel that way. Before he was arrested a week prior, the police had been staking him out and watching him. And he was not the feeble old man that we are now seeing in court recordings. He was out riding his motorcycle on the street. It takes some coordination to ride a motorcycle, man. I won't even drive a motorcycle. I don't have that. Well, to be fair, I don't drive anything, but I wouldn't ride a motorcycle because I don't have that coordination. And the guy that we are seeing in the court recordings doesn't have that coordination. He was seen riding like a stationary workout bike in his home. The day he was arrested, he was outside building a table. This is not an, an an unable bodied old man. He was fine. So if after all I've said throughout this video, you still have this vision in your brain um, that gives you some sort of compassion for this old man. Let's cut that shiz out right now because this guy is evil. He's awful and he's a game player. He stalked these people, terrorized them by staying in the house for a prolonged period of time during his attacks to prolong the fear before inevitably killing them. He proceeded to call them years later to make sure he could keep them traumatized as long as possible. And additionally, in April, after he was arrested, he was in an interview room where he was alone by himself, but being recorded, which he knew he was being recorded because he knows how police work. And he proceeded to talk to himself to make himself seem crazy. He would talk about a man named Jerry who lived in his brain and that he tried to get Jerry out of his head so that he could have a normal life, but he just kept coming back and messing it up. Okay. Okay, Joseph, I'm sure that that's true pause not. We all know that's not true. Or we all should know that's not true because allegedly you're full of shit. Because remember, this is a smart guy who knows how police work goes and is known for playing games 
and is just, we should have no compassion for this guy at all. So in April of 2019, it was announced that the police would be going after the death penalty for the murders. Unfortunately, there is no evidence that connects him to the Visalia ransacking cases, but police feel confident that they have the right guy. And this is, this is going to make you so mad. It makes me, it makes me so mad. The statutes of limitations has passed on all of the assault and rape cases so he cannot be charged with any of those crimes and that is just so upsetting to me i i don't know the reasoning behind the statutes of limitations on these types of crimes like certain things i get like if you rob i don't know like if you rob somebody 20 years ago maybe you don't go to jail anymore for it but if you rape somebody i don't really see why you would ever be able to not be tried for that and emotionally speaking because I don't have the information as to why it is this way but emotionally speaking it makes me super pissed I don't think it should be a thing I think it seems dated and insensitive and just ridiculous um but that's just me <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that's most of us but anyways in 2020 D'Angelo was charged with 13 counts of murder and 13 counts of kidnapping, though it's estimated that he committed at least 100 burglaries and at least 50 rapes in California, most of those being against teenage girls. Um, March of 2020, D'Angelo actually offered to plead guilty to all of his counts if they took the death penalty off the table, which police refused. They didn't think um, that he deserved to not be put to death. But at the same time, most of the prisoners who are on death row have better lives and better housing than those that are just like in prison. Um, they usually spend years and years and years on death row, sometimes dying before dying of natural causes before ever being put to death. So I don't know, part of me is like lock them up and throw away the key and get rid of the death penalty. But I also understand the the want for this guy to be dead but he's already like 70 at this point so though he does have you know probably 30 years left it, it could potentially take that long to execute him so i don't know let me know what you think on that i i, I know the death penalty is a sticky one i get why they want it like this guy get off you know but also he'd probably have a harder time if they just like put him in normal prison but in uh, June of 2020, a plea deal was made. D'Angelo pled guilty to all 13 counts of uh, murder and kidnapping. And even though he couldn't technically be charged with any of the rapes, he did admit to all of these crimes as well, giving the victims of these rapes at least some sort of closure and peace. And he did this in exchange for having the death penalty be taken off the table, which I think was a good move. I think that that's just like a... Because I can't imagine um, not knowing for sure if the person who raped you was gone, especially somebody who would then call you years later and harass you um, and keep you terrorized. I feel like it's incredibly valuable for those victims to have that solace in knowing this man has admitted to doing it and he is locked up for good. Um, and I mean, considering that if he had gotten the death penalty, he'd probably be living better anyways taking it off the table just seems smart to me. So that's where we're at now. Uh, when D'Angelo was caught, he was living a relatively normal life. I believe he was like 72 when he was caught. I didn't write the number down. Um, he had gotten a job in the 90s as a truck mechanic for like a grocery store and he worked there until 2017 uh, where he retired and then was promptly arrested a year after, which I think is just a great little bit of irony that I very much appreciate to be honest. Um, <laughs> looking forward to that retirement and then just finally getting arrested work all your life ready to relax and now uh plenty of time to relax guy at the time that he was caught he was living in his citrus heights home with his youngest daughter and his granddaughter he was known in the area as like the grumpy old man um they didn't people didn't really like him but they had no idea what he had done they were all it was like a very shocked community to learn that they had a monster like that living amongst them they they knew he was grumpy but they didn't know he was evil. And so that is this, the story, the tale of the Golden State Killer. I, I tried to do like a golden eye to be on theme. I hope it's not insensitive. I just wanted to 
be on theme, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, how crazy is this case, right? I find it so insane that he was a cop at the same time that he was doing these things, you know? That's, that's nuts, dude. That is ass bananas. It just shows that anyone can be bad. It doesn't matter who you think that person is or what profession they choose. Putting on a work uniform doesn't take away a bad person and there are wolves in sheep's clothing and that's just how it is and that's what makes it so scary especially because i don't believe he is the first police officer to commit murders i want to look into it a little bit more obvious well obviously he's not the first police officer to commit murders but you know what you you know what i mean um it's a scary thought um to imagine somebody whose job it is to protect and serve you uh killing you you know i think we all know <laughs> but anyways what are your guys' thoughts have you seen the videos of him and and seen how he's acting and did you feel bad for him because initially my first reaction was like oh but like no no i i don't feel bad for this guy he can literally suck up you know and dude what do you think about the statutes of limitations on rape that's just so frustrating and the whole ancestry thing i'm really curious as to what you guys think about the way that they caught him i want to know if you think it's a good thing or if you think it's a bad thing and where you think that could go because that's the concern on to me at least is where it could go because man we've been exploding like all of our advances in dna technology and just catching people it's crazy all the things we can do now i don't know how crimes were solved ever back then but now it's like I don't see how anybody can get away with it. Getting away with murder just doesn't seem really to be possible. Like maybe being a murderer is something that nobody should do besides like the obvious, like don't be a dick and kill people thing. You don't know how technology is going to advance and things that at the time that you're doing it would not get you caught are very likely to get you caught later. So maybe don't, maybe don't. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. Please let me know down below any cases you'd like me to cover because I am glad to see you guys are enjoying seeing these videos because I am enjoying doing them. Please, of course, before you go, don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and hitting the bell. As a small creator, every bit of interaction is extremely valuable. And I thank you immensely in advance, or if you already did it, thank you now. And I just wanna say thank you for being here when you could be anywhere else in the world, your tight, what we're doing here is tight and I hope to see you in my next video.